This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be on this. Well, at least in LA, nice Sunday morning. If you're missing the show, you're going to find out later because you forgot to change your clocks. And um, anyway, so so you're probably still sleeping. It's 8 o'clock in the morning for you, but it's really not 9 o'clock here. And um, anyway, here for you, here for your pets. Anything you want to talk about. Game! Fair game to talk about it. Love talking about pets, talking, talking to you, helping you through. I am waving to my Instagram friends. Hello, hello. And um, anyway, so how do you get a hold of me? Very easy. Well, if you are on Pet Life Radio right now, you're already here live. Just grab your pets and just join the show. There's an, a link left you there by our producer, Mark, and you can just kind of come and join us. If you're on Instagram, just ask away. And good, hey, good to see you too. So anyway, otherwise on Instagram, oh, by the way, you can call us toll free. I, a lot of people are embarrassed to be here live on the air. I don't know why. But call us toll-free at 877-385-8882. Once again, 877-385-8882. But again, we much prefer that you uh, join us here live on Instagram on Pet Life Radio. So uh, anyway, already have. Let's see. Let's get some questions going here. I'm going to do some waving. So my other sister is um, here at the house because we're doing something new. You may have heard of Talk Shop Live. So we're going to be introducing some of my new products to help you and your pets. So that's right after this show. Uh, you can join in to talk. Um, it's called Talk Shop Live. And you can order some stuff as well. So other than that, I hope uh, everyone had a great, I had a, a very interesting surgery. May as well talk about it. I'm going to be posting it. So this dog comes in. I was like the, the second opinion. They got to me from a friend of theirs. This dog is a uh, husky kind of cross. Very sweet. A little older. I think 11. And had apparently a couple of years ago, was diagnosed with a small bass on his back. So the doctor said, you know, feels it, felt kind of soft under it. She said it was probably a lipoma. The dog was nine at the time. Leave it alone. No big deal. So she left it alone. Months later go by and this thing is growing. But again, goes back to the vet and just says, no, it's probably just lipoma. They're benign, older dog. No reason to take it off. It's on the trunk. So it's not a problem. And this goes on and on and on until the dog's 11. And I see it. And this mass is huge. And it is not a lipoma. I, the reason I know that is because there's a certain consistency when you have these benign fatty tumors. And they're all, it's usually generalized, mostly encapsulated, so you can feel it. You can jiggle it around and you can feel you get underneath it. You can, it's not attached. So sometimes it's under the muscle, but again, it has a certain feel. And I said, no, this is lobular. It, some parts are soft, some parts are hard. This is not a fat. I know you know what it is, but knew it's not a fatty tumor. So we say, you know what? We really need to cut this off. And so we, we anesthetize and we do some blood work. Everything was fine. And we go ahead and I'm starting cutting off this mass. And it is huge. And it is deeply attached to the deeper skin, the you know, body wall. And it's crazy because here I am dissecting this thing, a bloody mess. And of course, we get, get it all out. Remove it. So this, I mean, at post-op is great. We put a drain in only because we anticipated having a lot of bleeding and oozing. So we put a drain in, and um, I said everything went really, really well. We're waiting for the biopsy results back, which I will share with you. But it, it was just amazing. Is you know, it's one thing that you have to understand when you have something that it seems to be bothering you, and you're getting an opinion. It's okay to get a second opinion. It's totally okay. I refer cases to specialists regularly. And I, I call myself a jack of all trades, master of none. I do a lot. I do a lot more surgery than most GPs do. I do a lot of ophthalmology more than GPs do. But I mean, I'm still not a, I never claim to be an expert in any of these. So if I have a really tough case, I refer it. So what a lot of sometimes doctors don't understand, you're not really losing a case when you refer. What you are doing is gaining trust. Why? Because if I send a very difficult case, a challenging case, and I'm just, I, I just cannot figure it out. My treatment's not working. I think I know what it is, but, but, but. And I send it to the expert, and they too have a big difficult time, or say you have to do this very fancy testing and it's going to be expensive, et cetera. At least I feel good now, and they feel good because I referred it to them 
And even the expert couldn't come up with an easy answer. So I don't look so bad right now that I couldn't figure it out. Or the other side of the coin is I send it to the expert and the expert is able to fix the problem. That's all that specialist does is that arena. They're not going to do, if they're in internal medicine, they're not going to do skin problems. So they're coming back to me and they thank me for referring them because they got an answer. They got a solution. And I don't know why it's so difficult for some veterinarians to say, you know what? I'm not getting it. I don't know what to do. Maybe we should call in the expert and get some, get an opinion. And um, I think that really is the smartest thing you do. So if you are having an issue, that seems to be a chronic problem and you are not getting the result that you are expecting, um, it's not being taken care of. Don't be afraid to say, you know what? Is there, is there an expert in this field or, or talk to friends, neighbors, get a second opinion. It's worse from a general practitioner standpoint. It's worse not to refer. It's worse not to be able to give an answer than you messing around with the case and trying and trying and trying. At some point, you got to say, you know what? I'm going to get help. Anyway, fortunately, I was able to help this dog. Unfortunately, I believe it's going to come back as some sort of malignant tumor. At this point, the lungs were clear. Obviously, we're going to have to be on, on the lookout for some spread of this tumor, whatever the case may be. But I'm going to share it with you. I'm going to, I'm going to post it and post the surgery. I hope you're, uh, <laughs> if the sight of blood bothers you, you may not want to tune in because <laughs> it's bloody. You know, it was one of those that, because it's so vascular. And that's another one, you, you know, when you get a, a, a very vascular tumor, it's usually something that, that is, is not good. And um, so anyway, you, you make a cut, you're dissecting slowly, you're going through layer by layer, trying to get down to the whole thing. See, this thing weighed two pounds. It was big. And you get these squirters, you get the bleeders. You know, that's how you know when I'm working with these young, we're right near UCLA, where I'm working at Value Vet in Westwood. So we're getting a lot of UCLA pre-vets that always come by and they want to volunteer. And I never say no. I love to help them. I love to mentor. And as a matter of fact, this Wednesday, speaking of mentoring, I'm going back to my high school, Beverly Hills High. And every year they have a very well-developed program. It's a career day, they call it. And they have literally over 150 different professions that are being represented. Of course, they like their, if there are any of their graduates, their alums to come and talk in that. And so in my era, which is, I mean, I graduated in 72. In my era, there were four veterinarians that graduated Be Beverly. That's from my older sister down to my youngest brother. There are four of us. So it, it spans a number of years and only four veterinarians. So two of them, one, the year ahead of me actually graduated, year in 1971, he is already retired. Then I don't know how you can retire in this, but anyway, he's already retired. Then there was one in a class below me who I was good friends with in vet school. He also was at Davis. And then there was one in my little sister's class, who's and the, those two are equine veterinarians. One I think is in Colorado. My friend Mark is down in, in Rancho Cucamonga. So I'm the only small animal veterinarian that graduated UC Davis in that era. There are some others that went to vet, um, the Beverly, but I don't know if they come back. Anyway, I have a blast, and I used to really like glorify the profession because for me, it is glorified. It's the best thing on the planet. But you realize it's a lot of hard work. And I know when I was in vet school, and there were some classmates that were way smarter than I as undergrads. I did really well in vet school, but not so much in undergrad. And that's what happened when you're in Berkeley in the early 70s. There are some other things that become more important than studying. And I don't want to go into them now, but <laughs> I guess you can imagine. Anyway, so I worked and worked and worked. I worked four years between a uh, you know, master's program and then you know, working as a technician and then a senior tech and a head tech and all that. Anyway, so for me, the sight of blood was nothing. But I'll tell you, you know which one of your classmates did not really witness a lot of surgery before they got into vet school because these ones would get really queasy and faint as soon as they saw that blood popping out of, a, out of an incision. So it was fun. All right. I, there are some questions coming. So let me take advantage of that. My ears were burning. Yes, yes, yes. Hold on. Last week, you gave me advice on the dentist with six teeth removed my advice. Okay. One thing I find, you know, people go nuts when they have a dentistry and uh, stuff that I posted, for example, and there are a lot of extractions. People go, what's he going to eat? How, how's he going to eat? He won't be able to eat. First of all, they do fine. And secondly, what we notice which is how we know that dental disease really impacts our pets. Because when we do that thorough cleaning, when we do those extractions, the comments that we get back from the pet parents, oh my God, he's like a puppy again. So he wasn't showing any signs of illness. He was eating and he was breathing. Everything was seemed okay, but there's something lacking and you don't know it until 
you take care of the problem, and then they come back as with so much more energy. It's actually amazing. So Abby Salzberg. So yes, if you're an aspiring veterinarian, love that. Yes, absolutely. You can contact me here on Instagram. Uh, we can set something up. I love working with these young students. As I said, I'm lecturing in the high school. Oh, but one thing, one thing I do with reality now, I used to only glorify the profession. Now I let, I let them know what it's like because I say, look, at the end of today's hour, I'm going to feel equally as satisfied if I support your decision. If at the end of this, you still, after all the things we talk about, you still want to become a veterinarian, but also at the end of what we talk about, and I give you the reality and you choose not to say, you know what? Hmm, I love animals, but this is not for me. Trust me, you're not hurting my feelings. I will feel equally as satisfied. Why? Because I want the earlier you know whether this is something you want to tackle, right? The better it's going to be for you. What you don't want to do is go through high school and then start doing college. And then when you get your first job or volunteering and you realize, oh my God, this is what you guys do? Hmm, not for me. Or this much science? Ooh, not for me. So the earlier you learn what it's going to entail and help you make a decision that way, those in, in the group to raise their hands, if you still, after all this, you still want to go into this and they still say yes, I said, you got it, you got it. You hang in there, you do well, you will make a good vet. So anyway, it's one of those things. Having a pseudo-pregnancy, ah, okay. So pseudo-pregnancy, one, okay. So let's talk about that for a second. One of the reasons that we recommend spaying, now again, we've changed our, our dates a little bit. We used to do it before six months, before the first heat. Now we're saying, no, 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 have at least one heat. In fact, maybe only one heat because it does solve some problems down the road. For large breeds, females, um, it is definitely 35% reduction in the incidence of osteosarcoma, bone cancer, there was an increase by 35% in those dogs that were pre-pubertally spayed. So obviously, we want to do what we can to help that. We find that for early spay neuter, a lot of these dogs, as they get older, they have more urinary incontinence. Again, what the link is, probably estrogen type and the exposure early on that might do something to the urinary sphincter muscle. I, again, I, we don't know exactly what it is, but it's, it's empirical data. So I don't know, I'm sure there's, there must be studies, but I'm not familiar with them, but we've seen it and, and often recommend, you know what, let them have a heat. So that's really important. Now, what is pseudopregnancy? So a lot, and it doesn't often happen if, if, with only having one heat, but it does happen, and I've seen it a number of times. So here it is, about eight weeks after heat. Remember, gestation is nine weeks, 63 plus or minus five days. So 58 to 68 days is normal gestation. So eight weeks, right, that is very possible. So what's happening is that you end up with a dog who is acting as if she's pregnant. She is going to start to nest. Her mammary glands are going to engorge with, with milk, and she is going to go through the motions as if she's... Now, there are no puppies in there. I mean, she wasn't even bred. But in her mind, hormonally, she's going to have puppies. So they go through this, what we call false pregnancy, and the digging, there she's starting to nest. And the crying, it's really crazy how emotionally and physically they are pregnant. They're not, but they, the body certainly is telling them they are. So uh, anyway, not to worry. Let this happen. It's going to last. She's going to have her imaginary puppies. And then after when this is all over and the swelling goes down, she should be spayed. Absolutely. We talked about the second thing. I wanted to assume other things. There's basically, the, we talked about the, the canine respiratory complex last year. It's getting lower and lower. However, I'm still recommending where I, I never used to recommend it as a core vaccine. But again, I have to listen to the experts. And I, again, if their advice is because of this new bug, this new disease that was going around, we should also be including influenza along with the power influenza, which comes automatically with your distemper shot and with the Bordetella. So I'm still recommending that. This is interesting. For those of you that are moms and dads, this was a great uh, story. Dogs, get kids moving more. Children with dogs get more exercise, more walking and playing. And researchers saw a particularly big difference for girls with dogs as far as light intensity exercise So and the activity. So their light intensity activity increased by almost an hour daily. And just by having these dogs and paying with them, going outside, throwing the ball, taking them for a walk. So this stuff is, is I mean, it's pretty amazing. And we already know the benefits of pet parenting. And as far as kids are concerned, there are many other really cool benefits as well, such as, interestingly, we'll talk about when we get back from break, academic performance. 
So don't go away. So those of you with kids, right, you want to know these things because it is to your advantage to have those pets. We're right back after these short messages. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> And, and we're back. We're back here live. So during the break, we're talking about a, uh, a follower, Karen, who has a two and a half year old Gordon Setter. And I was saying how Gordon Setter's Iris Setter, I mean, Iris Setters used to be a golden retriever. They used to be. I mean, there were so many of them in the 70s. And now you barely see. I don't. I think I have two. And I think I have one or two Gordons, one or two English. And that's about it. Anyway, what age should a male be neutered? So again, for large breed dogs, 100%, we are fearful because that statistic about the female and the bone cancer actually is worse with the male. 65% greater incidence in long bone cancer in these dogs, male dogs that were pre puberty neutered. That's huge. So for large breeds, I recommend at least a year, preferably 18 months. And for giant breeds, I even say two years before neutering. Because the good news is, that other than their behavior, there's no downside to holding off on a male like there is a female. With the female, with each uh, with the advancing heats, the, even with the second one, their their risk reduction of breast cancer, mammary cancer, starts to basically fall off. It goes like ninety eight percent if you spay them before the first heat. Goes about eighty eight to ninety percent if you spay them after the first, but before the second. But if she has that second heat or a litter during that first heat, it's almost zero risk reduction. So you want to get them. You want to get them spayed. Males, however, all the male problems with the testosterone and the testicles are mostly older dog problems. The prostate issues, benign prostatic hyperplasia, the perianal adenomas that grows around the anus, uh, the fistulas. These are all things that happen usually later on in life. So therefore, you could wait a little bit. So for a, a Gordon Setter, I would say a year and a half. So if he's already two and a half, you can do it anytime. This is the behavior issue that worries me. Because we've talked about this before, but for those of you that are new, if you just use simple statistics and say, okay, let's assume half the dogs in America are male, half are female. Let's say, now let's say half are spayed, neutered, and half aren't. Okay, it's probably more spayed or neutered than not, but let's say half. So that means any quadrant, spayed female, non spayed female, spayed and non spayed, non neutered male, and, and neutered male would be 25% each. So if, if it was randomized, and it says, okay, then what is the likelihood that any dog that is hit in the street, get killed by a car, is one of those four? Is that spayed female, intact female, neutered male, intact male? And you say, well, if it's 25, if it's just statistically random, 25% chance. Well, guess what? 75, 75% of dogs found dead on US roads and highways are non neutered males. What does it tell you? That tells you like the same thing I saw a case this week where this dog had a severe skin infection. For, and fortunately, that's all it was. A road burn, but he was obviously hit. Fortunately, no bones broken. And guess what? He had between his back legs, a very healthy set of testicles. So this dog, 100% should be neutered because they roam. That's what they do. They roam. They want to roam. And we need to protect against that. So uh, anyway, I would certainly get, get him neutered. But okay, the... Um, uh, Michelle, you got two questions, so they're both good ones. So let's ask. So first of all, my 10-year-old cattle hula mix has multiple lipomas. I keep finding more. I asked the vet to needle biopsy, but I said, but nervous is, is accurate. I, I don't know what that, something didn't come out right. But let's talk about, yes, if there are masses, even though you're pretty darn sure it's something benign, I would still do a cytology. Very easy to do in-house. If you're worried, 
Uh, there's, you know, we have this new system now called Imagist. It's AI. We put the slides, we send them Imagist, and they are uh, AI gives us an answer. It's much less expensive than a pathologist. If we really have something that is very important, very serious, then yes, we'll send it off for cytology to be read by a board certified veterinary pathologist. But it's great to know what you're dealing with or what you're not dealing with. I always recommend poking. And again, I learned this because I was pretty cocky coming out of school, right? And all of a sudden, I am a young associate, and it's what I could for sure, for sure, was a lipoma. And I said to her, I said, what would you do? And she's, because she was kind of meek and a little embarrassed to see, she goes, um, because it was what you're taught. Well, she goes, I, I would probably do a cytology. Well, I mean, it's a lipoma. But yeah, sure. No, no downside. Sure enough, it wasn't a site. It wasn't a lipoma. It was something worse. And from then on, even on the easy ones, I'm going to go ahead and do a cytology. So if they are lipomas, then, so what are the criteria do I use for lipoma? Well, first of all, to remove. I usually, take, truth be told, I don't like doing them because they're benign, just to do it. In other words, if I already have the dog down for another procedure like a dentistry, much more necessary, much more important, or if it's younger and have it, we haven't been neutered yet, then I say to the, the client, you know what, when he or she is going to be down for anesthesia for something else, that's when we'll take it off. Now, let's say it's rapidly growing or an area that is causing a problem. Like my mom's Adobe that had a, a, a huge lipoma. Well, it wasn't huge when it started, but it got huge because I kept saying, let's wait, let's wait, let's wait. And it was under the arm and the dog, I mean, had to walk funny. Even at 15 years of age is when we, we removed it. So then I would you primarily do the surgery just to remove that lipoma. So it's, again, it's something that it depends how much problem it's causing, where it's located. If it's a benign, like another benign, like a wart even, but the dog is scratching at it and it's always bleeding. Yes. Do I, do I think we need to do a surgery to remove a wart? Of course not. But if it's becoming a problem, I won't wait for the next dentistry. I will do it just for that. And then while it's down, as we know, most dogs could use the cleaning anyway, regardless of when it is. So unless they had it two weeks before, so I will then add the dentistry to that. So, um, but I waited on my Labrador and I, until there were like six or seven of them. And then I you know, said, I got, when I did his teeth, I said, okay, here's a good example. Now, good time to do it. And I knocked off all of the lipomas. Okay, a test you can order online to check for cancer. What are your thoughts? So there are a couple of tests out there. There is the Oncocanine. The Oncocanine is, by most of the experts I've spoken to, the better test. It is very expensive and it has its limitations. So cytology is great. If you want, if you want to really just screen your dog for cancer, then you could do that test, but it doesn't tell you what cancer, and it doesn't tell you where it is. So now you still got a big hunt anyway. Now, now that you know there's something there, might a very thorough ultrasound be in order? Maybe even a, a CT or an MRI might be in order. So it just says, yes, there is an, an issue here. We want to explore it, and I think it should be explored. That's very important if you have that test come back positive. Now, I am testing a new product, which is really cool. And it's a technology that's coming out of Israel. It's a little machine. It's called the HT Vista. And uh, they, they selected me in my practice to be one of the hospitals. They've already gone through testing. It's approved, but now they want to get it out into the real world. And so um, I worked with them. And what it does, it is a little device, a little handheld device that hooks into a, either your phone or to an iPad. And you put it over a mass in the skin. You let it sit there for two minutes, and it reads somehow the heat exchange between the delivery of this device, what is it's emitting something, and how it comes back on the machine. And it tells you whether or not the mass that you're testing is a malignant mass or a benign mass, which is really, really cool. Because if it's benign, then we could say, you know what, it's there, but it's benign. So wait, wait until the next dentistry. Then if you want, we can take it off or leave it. Where it's, if it's malignant, ah, now you're going to take your chest x-rays. You might do an ultrasound of the liver, look for other areas where it may have already spread, metastatic, and then you're going to schedule surgery to, to remove it. It is way less expensive to use for that test than sending cytology off to the pathologist. And you get your answer immediately. It's really, really cool. So um, I have, I have, I have a, a training module that I have to do. I'm going to try to do it this week. I don't know if I'll be able to. It's like it's an hour. 
and I want to do it with my technicians. And the problem is, is that many of you know from who've come and see me at my hospital, for me to sit for one hour and not see patients, that's going to be really hard. I mean, I'm either seeing patients all day and setting out my time for surgery. I set myself three hours. I never get three hours. I'm lucky to get two. So anyway, but this device is really, really cool. And uh, that's, I'm looking forward to using it. Would you still recommend spaying an eight-year-old poodle? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because first of all, as we talked about, yes, we just talked about false pregnancies. That happens usually to younger animals. What happens to older, intact females that could be deadly is pyometra. That's a uterine infection. And it comes in, there's an open pyo and a closed pyo. The open pyo, they're draining the pus. It's not, I mean, it's still bad, but it's not as bad. If it's a closed pyo and there's all that pus that's forming in the uterus cannot drain out, you have one very sick dog. I've seen dogs before with a you know a normal white blood cell count. A dog might be 17 and a half thousand, 18,000 I can live with, 70,000 white cells. That's a huge infection. That's like sepsis. So, and there's no way you're going to breed an eight year old poodle. So, even the breeders, this is even legitimate, well known breeders that are extremely conscientious, that know the rules, they know what, how to handle problems during, during whelping. I mean, these are good, legit breeders. They will get their dog spayed, their females, after six or seven years of age because they don't want to breed them again. And they know all the problems associated with not fixing them. So, they fix them. Uh, six or seven years of age when they're done breeding. So 100%, yes, you want to um, get this dog spayed. So Cloud Chaser, let me see what you got for me. Osteosarcoma in the rear leg of a six-year-old cat. Oh, and they part of the pelvis. You set some radiation schedule. What's this radiation feel like in an animal? Well, they actually do fairly well in radiation. They have to be anesthetized, obviously, um, because they won't sit still. But uh, that is really weird for an osteo and a cat. Very unusual. Usually, I mean, it's a big dog problem. And I always say this, that when we talk about things, conditions, diseases that are usually seen in one particular animal, I used to say, you know, there's no such thing as never. I say it's unlikely. It doesn't happen frequently, but can it happen? Anything can happen to any dog. You can have a hyperthyroid dog. Now, 99% of the dogs for thyroid disorder, it's hypothyroid. Cats get hyperthyroid, but can it happen? Yes. So, you know, you learn, and it's just don't say, never say never because things could surprise me. I'm surprised the treatment is correct. Amputate the leg, part of the pelvis, radiation scheduled. They do fairly well. Understand. Now, again, because I so infrequently see it in a cat that I can't tell you for sure that the statistics are the same, but even in dogs, even with amputation and with radiation and with the carboplatin, they still have a, a limited lifespan. It might be if you're lucky to get two years. You probably won't, but you're lucky too. All right. Anyway, that's all we have time for. I have to start my, my little live show. If you want to go to, I believe it's talkshop.live. That's what it is. Talkshop.live. Look them up. You'll see my show and I've got some good stuff for you. Anyway, thanks for uh, joining me here on Pet Life Radio and Instagram Live. We will be here next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. And then the week, yeah, I'll be here next couple of weeks. I'm going to Global Pet Expo the following week, but I'm back for the weekend. So that, that Sunday, I think it's the 25th or whatever, um, I will be um, sharing a bunch of stuff, new stuff that I picked up at the, uh, at the um, Global Pet Expo, which is great. Mark, I will see you next week, and I will see you at Global Pet Expo. We have some meetings we're going to have to do. So, all right, sounds great, everybody. See you next week. Bye. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs>